Eggnog is one of those holiday drinks that you either love or you really, really hate. Personally, I love it, especially when it is made from scratch because it doesn't actually taste like what you're going to get at the store. And that is why today I am making from scratch George Washington's unbelievably boozy eggnog. But did our founding father actually make this eggnog? We'll discuss that and more, this time on Tasting History. So with the holidays upon us, I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for the most amazing gift that I never knew I wanted. And that is for you all watching Tasting History um, all year, my Tastorians. It has been absolutely mind-blowing. I, I think that my goal at the beginning of the year was to hit 1,000 subscribers by the end of the year. That was, that was the goal. And we made it because I think that we're sitting at around 450,000 right now, maybe even a little bit more by the time I post this, so awesome. Thank you so much. And if you haven't subscribed, do it now. Maybe we'll hit 500 by the end of the year, but that's actually too much pressure. Just thank you for watching. Anyway, George Washington's eggnog. One quart cream, one quart milk, one dozen tablespoon sugar, one pint brandy, a half pint rye whiskey, a half pint Jamaica rum, a quarter pint sherry. Mix liquor first, then separate yolks and whites of 12 eggs. Add sugar to beaten yolks, Mix well. Add milk and cream, slowly beating. Beat whites and eggs until stiff and fold slowly into mixture. Let set in cool place for several days. Taste frequently. I like that last instruction, taste frequently. And I took that to heart all week long, though I'm not exactly sure what I was supposed to be tasting for, but I did as George Washington suggests. And that brings me to the question, is this actually George Washington's recipe? Well, according to the Farmer's Almanac, yes, it is. Supposedly, it came from the kitchen papers at Mount Vernon, but in every collection of the kitchen papers that I could find, I didn't find this recipe. And in fact, the first time that this recipe seems to have come about wasn't until 1948 in a book called Christmas with the Washingtons by Olive Bailey. And she doesn't really cite her sources. Not that it's the, the kind of book that you would expect that, but still not a lot of help. So could it even be George Washington's recipe? Yeah, it could. It does read like a recipe from the time period, from like the late 1700s. And we do have recipes from George Washington, who actually wrote them down. We have one for beer that he did. And this recipe includes rye whiskey. George was a big fan. He actually had one of the largest rye whiskey distilleries in America at the time. Plus, eggnog was a very popular drink in the late 1700s. But, could it be that Miss Bailey just took another recipe and attributed it to George Washington as an act of literary license? Yes, maybe. We'll probably never know. But I ask you, does it matter? It reads like a historical recipe, it's filled with booze, and maybe it is just another one of those pieces of lore surrounding George Washington, like his false teeth being made of wood or chopping down the cherry tree, I cannot tell a lie. But while those are a little hard to swallow, I don't think this one's going to be. So what you'll need is one quart or 950 milliliters of cream, one quart or 950 milliliters of whole milk, three fourths of a cup or 150 grams of sugar, 12 medium eggs, or 10 large eggs or eight extra large eggs, two cups or 475 milliliters of brandy, one cup or 235 milliliters rye whiskey, one cup or 235 milliliters dark rum, and a half cup of sherry. You want to use something like a cream sherry, a little bit sweeter than a really dry sherry, though either one will work, but stay away from that cooking sherry. In fact, just leave that at the store. Now there is one ingredient that is missing that is included in a lot of other contemporary eggnog recipes, and that is nutmeg. So, as to not upset John Townsend, I am going to add some nutmeg. I'm going to add one teaspoon into the whole recipe, and then I'll probably grate a little bit on top at the end as well. But it is optional. It's not included in the original recipe, but it's going to make things taste better. So the recipe says to mix the liquors first. I honestly don't know why, but that's what the recipe says, so that's what I did. Next, separate your eggs and add the yolks to a bowl and beat them until they go from a dark yellow to a nice pale yellow. Then slowly beat in the sugar. It's important that you do this just a little bit at a time. If you put it all in, it's not going to incorporate properly. Beating slowly, add in your milk, and your cream. 
Now I started with what I thought was going to be a big enough bowl, but clearly I didn't do my math right and it was not big enough at all, so I had to switch to my Le Creuset Dutch oven. You can feel free to cut it in half because this recipe really is like enough for an entire party, um, but if you are going to make the full recipe, make sure to get the biggest bowl that you possibly can. Then add in the liquor and mix everything together until nice and smooth. If you are going to add nutmeg or any other spices, cinnamon or ginger or whatever you want, go ahead and do that right now. Next, with either beaters or a whisk, whisk your egg whites until they form nice stiff peaks. One important note, if you are going to be using the same beaters that you used on the egg yolks, make sure to wash and dry them thoroughly because even a little bit of yolk can stop the whites from achieving the nice stiff peaks that you're looking for. Then ever so slowly fold the beaten egg whites into the yolk and cream mixture until nicely incorporated. Now at this point you should have a nice frothy eggnog, and really you can actually drink it right now, but it does say to let it age for a few days in a nice cool spot, so I put mine into the refrigerator for five days. Make sure to cover it though. Now while we wait for our nog to age, all the while tasting frequently, let's take a gander at this creamy yet polarizing Christmas cocktail. Eggnog, eggs, and nog. What is nog? Sounds like something that Pinky would say. Nog! There are actually a few theories kicking around as to where this term nog comes from. In 1693, the Dean of Norwich in England, a Mr. Humphrey Prideaux, wrote, You will find him walking about his room with a pipe in his mouth, and a bottle of claret and a bottle of old strong beer, which in this country they call nog, upon the table. So maybe it's this strong beer, this nog, that lent its name to what we're making today. Eggs in strong beer makes eggnog. And there is actually another drink called posset, which had been consumed at least since the Middle Ages, that was usually made with milk and strong beer. Though it could also be done with wine, and later uh, recipes call for eggs. So it seems a natural evolution. Kind of makes sense. Interesting, if slightly off-putting fact about this alcohol curdled milk drink called posset is that today posset or posseting refers to when a baby spits up milk after feeding. So I think we should change that to eggnogging. You want to definitely wear that little, um, that little blanket over your shoulder so the baby doesn't eggnog all down your back. Yeah. Another theory is that the word comes from the word noggin, which before it meant your head referred to a wooden cup. And then another is that it actually came from the word nug, which in Scotland at the time was an ale that was warmed by sticking a red-hot poker in it. Possible. The last theory is that it's a contraction of the words egg and grog, though I don't think that's right because one, it didn't come around until the 1980s, this theory. Two, there's almost no evidence for it because if it had been egg and grog, surely there would have been a point in time where it was egg grog and we never see that happening. So how it turned into eggnog, that just doesn't make sense. But regardless of where the name came from, it gained popularity in America around the mid 18th century. Fog drams in the morn, or better still, eggnog. At night, hot suppings, and at midday grog, my palate can regale. That's one of the very first written mentions of eggnog from 1775, written by a Mr. Jonathan Butcher or Boucher. He was English, so it's impossible to say how he pronounced it, but it kind of reminds me of the Keeping Up Appearances quote, Boucher residence, lady of the house speaking. Except that was bouquet residence, but if you've never watched that show, it's really funny. What's interesting in regards to our recipe today is that this Mr. Boucher or Butcher was actually a good friend of George Washington and even taught his stepson, John Custis. Kind of weird, right? There's another contemporary story from Virginia where Washington lived that impresses me to no end. See, in today's drinking contest, you're rarely asked to do more than throw a ping pong ball into a cup six feet away. Not that hard. But in the 18th century, it seems that they liked to test their mental acuity when they were drunk. On last Christmas Eve, several gentlemen met at Northampton Courthouse and spent the evening in mirth and festivity when eggnog was the principal liquor used by the company. After they had indulged pretty freely in this beverage, a gentleman in company offered a bet that not one of the party could write four verses extempore, which should be rhyme and sense. The author then goes on to tell how this supposedly inebriated contestant spits out off the cuff a poem which extols the virtues of eggnog over wine, and includes the stanza, "'Tis eggnog now, whose golden streams dispense far richer treasures to the ravished sense. 
The muse from wine derives a transient glare, but eggnog's daughters afford her solid fare. I can't imagine being able to come up with that completely sober with as much time as I was allowed. I, it's just, I'm always impressed by 18th and 19th century people and their ability to, to craft things with words. Clearly something I do not, do not possess, craft things with words. Anyway, by this writing, we can see that Christmas and eggnog had a connection. It was being drunk on Christmas Eve. But where did that connection come from? We don't really know. I mean, it could have been served hot at times, which would make sense to have it then in the winter months. Um, other drinks, such as the nug that I mentioned, as well as something called Smoking Bishop that was popular in the 19th century, where they would take a red-hot poker and stick it into the drink to, to warm it up, were very, very popular at the time, so maybe they did the same thing with eggnog. Who knows? Also, Christmas being a special occasion, it might have warranted the cost of making eggnog, because even without the liquor, the eggs, the cream, and especially the sugar were very, very expensive at the time. It was even enough to possibly put a dint in old, wealthy Washington's purse. In a letter written on December 26, 1788, Washington admitted, I have never before felt the want of cash so severely as at present. And of course, any monies that may arise from my property under your care could never come more opportunely than at this time. Now, was it really eggnog that made him cash poor that year? Or had he been remodeling his kitchen or impulse bought a horse? Who knows? But it is clear that the Washingtons did like to splurge at the holidays. They would often host large parties with guests staying at Mount Vernon. They would go fox hunting and drinking and have exotic animals come visit. Yes, in his Christmas expense ledger in 1787, Washington wrote, By the man who brought a camel from Alexandria for a show, 18 shillings. After the fox hunting and the camel peeping, there were often big meals, something that Washington once referred to as the attack of Christmas pies, which I just love. There was one pie that they had that was a turkey, a goose, a fowl, a partridge, and a pigeon baked into a crust. Then on Twelfth Night, Martha Washington would serve her famous great cake, which was made with 40 eggs and 4 pounds of butter. So between that and the eggnog, the poor chickens and cows of Mount Vernon must have found Christmas time very taxing. And add insult to injury, a camel is getting all of the attention. Really not fair. But you really can't fault poor George Washington for wanting to splurge a little bit at the holidays, because for much of his life, Christmas sucked. In 1740, when George was only eight years old, his home on Ferry Farm burnt down on Christmas Eve. Then during Christmas of 1753, during the French and Indian War, George got shot at by a group of French Indians at a place endearingly called Murdering Town. Then in 1777, during the American Revolution, while running low on food and whiskey, Washington and his army of 12,000 spent Christmas at Valley Forge, where upwards of one out of six of them would die. And then on Christmas Day in 1790, George found out that his favorite horse, Nelson, the horse that had got him through the Revolutionary War, had died. I mean, come on. Give this man a break. Christmas hasn't been this hard on a George since It's a Wonderful Life. But just as George Bailey, in hindsight, had had some really wonderful Christmases, so too did George Washington. One of his most memorable was in 1776, when he crossed the Delaware to surprise a camp of Hessian mercenaries. Cold and wet perhaps at the time, in hindsight, it was a very good Christmas for our founding father. Now in contrast to the popular myth that the Germans who were fighting on behalf of the English were drunk that day, John Greenwood, a continental soldier who was actually there, wrote, I am willing to go upon oath that I did not see even a solitary drunken soldier belonging to the enemy. Fortunately for me, I don't have any battles to fight today, so I look forward to having a nice cup of George Washington's eggnog. So after a few days, or really whenever you want, go ahead and serve yourself a glass of eggnog. As I said, I'm gonna grate a little fresh nutmeg on top. And here we are. George Washington eggnog. Maybe. Eggnog all the same. Let's give it a try. Top is foamy. That is, that is good. Oh my gosh, that is so strong. <laughs> It really hits you. At first, it's like, oh, it's sweet and creamy, and then it's like, oh, it's sweet and creamy. <laughs> it doesn't taste anything like modern-day eggnog, like what you would get at the store. I mean, it's just, it's totally different. It's creamy and, and rich, but it's not 
thick and you know sometimes like it it coats the the stuff that you get at the store like coats your throat this this isn't it's much lighter actually um it's very boozy it's really good i would actually add a little bit of cinnamon or or ginger or more nutmeg you know to kind of make the flavors come alive even more but as it is it's really really good so instead of a standard Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, I'm going to leave you with some words from George Washington himself. We remain in status quo and all unite in offering you and yours the compliments of the season and the return of many, many more and happy ones. Thanks for watching.